things, uh, both in the anthropology department and I was chair of the Center for Migration and Diaspora Studies whilst I was at SOAS, now very capably being run by Ruba Sello, who's organized this session. Um, and I'm delighted to be able to introduce to you Dr. Professor Anandi Ramamurthy, um, who's going to be talking today about um, something I think which is really important in our current moment. When we look around us, especially with what's been happening in the States overnight, and we look at the impact of COVID-19 and the absolute hollowing out, if you like, of our democratic institutions, plus the visceral um, ways that COVID is exposing the inequalities which are classed, race and gendered in our current world, it would seem to be a moment where it's particularly important for us to look to ways that we can create alliances and solidarities, ways that we can come together to actually form an effective opposition and resistance to what's taking place at the current moment. So um, Professor Ramamurthy, what she's going to be doing today is talking mainly about her book, Black Star, which is looking at the Asian movements, the youth movements of the 1970s and 80s in Britain. Now, this was a period where racism was really rampant in this country, where state racism was getting particularly acute. Uh, police racism was really making itself felt. Uh, and it was also a time when the British left, I mean, this sounds all too familiar, I think, to a lot of us, but a time when the British left was absolutely failing to really understand what was taking place and failing to show any sort of solidarity or meaningful um, uh, sort of help in, in, in ways that were at all effective. So it really did end up being communities themselves that had to self-organize uh, at this point in time. Um, and the Asian youth movements are particularly interesting because they were formulated by a confluence of circumstances which consisted of the anti-colonial movements that were taking place, uh, black power in the States and also what was happening in the, in, in the UK. So I'm going to hand over to Professor Emma Wilby now. She's going to be talking for about half an hour, 40 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll open up the session to discussion and questions. So thank you. Right, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see that, everyone? Yeah? Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for that introduction, um, Parvati. And um, in thinking about how I was going to start this, this talk, um, I was thinking about many of those same things that you've just referred to. Um, and the fact that we're, we are living in a time of such, such sharp contradictions and conflicts. And the pandemic in a way has brought out both the best and the worst in our society. It's sharpened our understanding of the impact of racism on our own lives and on those of our communities. We've also seen resistance and solidarity through the thousands who supported the call of Black Lives Matter as well as intense compassion of the mutual aid groups who tried to support those deepest in crisis uh, during the pandemic, well, and still in the pandemic. One of the clearest messages that the pandemic has left us with is that racism kills. And it kills us in many different ways, through the stress on our bodies and minds, through placing us in positions of vulnerability at work, on the front line, through the violence of the police, through state practices and policies that deny or marginalize our sufferings and our histories, and the violence of the state through its immigration laws that leaves sizable sections of our communities vulnerable, living as second-class citizens. The issues that have driven people to protest on the streets this summer are very similar to the issues that mobilized the Asian youth movements to organize 40 years ago. Racist violence, racist murders, the lack of dignity afforded to us in crisis, the denial of our contribution to society and the violence of the immigration laws. So I want today to think about what we can learn from those who organized then um, and what lessons they can teach us that will help us to work more effectively to create a just and an anti-racist um, society. I want it, I don't seem to be able to get it to, ah, oh, okay. 
So the Asian youth movements that emerged 30 years ago provide us with an example of the power of independent organizations and the possibility of fighting injustice and winning. And I think that's the important thing is they set out to, to win, not just to raise a concern. They were part of a wider anti-racist movement that spoke truth to power, gave people of color a chance to challenge discrimination in their own voice and expressed at its most effective moments the value of broad-based solidarities. The movements that formed in Bradford, Sheffield, Manchester, Coventry, Leicester, Birmingham and London, as well as in towns such as Bolton, Burnley, Luton and Watford, fought against racist violence, the racism of the immigration laws, as well as the racism of trade unions and of employers. Adopting an anti-imperialist analysis, they drew attention to racism as an exercise of power that was acutely linked to the development of capital accumulation across the globe. Inspired by the histories of resistance to racism and slavery in the US, as well as anti-colonial struggles in their own communities and those across Africa and Asia in the 60s and 70s, they organized with a recognition of the link between their own struggles and those of peoples resisting colonialism and imperialist expansion across the globe. As such, they provide an example of a movement that sought to create solidarities between oppressed groups that were non-sectarian, including individuals of all faiths and none. By the end of the 80s, however, the broad-based unity within which they had operated was fractured with the rise of identity politics and shifting geopolitical imperatives that led to increasing sectarianism. And the Black, um, um, Black Lives Matter movement in some ways has made inroads to reclaiming a kind of a wider solidarity framework. So just for a little bit of background, um, the late 1970s, um, in Britain saw the children of the post-war migrants reach adulthood. Brought here by their parents, having attended school in Britain, they had dreams and aspirations which were shattered by the discrimination in the various areas of their life. And most importantly, they were, imbued, they were viewed as a problem by the state. Um, and that happened really very much from the point when immigration laws with the 1962 um, act, um, seeing them in a sense as being a problem and therefore this, um, this, this migration needing to, needing to be controlled. Many of the youth movements were formed in response to street violence and the two pictures on the screen here relate to um, the moment uh, when a Southall youth movement um, was formed, the one on the, rest, uh, on the right referred to the unrest that took place in Southall at that point after Gurdeep Singh Chugga's death in 1976, which in a sense was a trigger for the youth to organize. Um, they, they started to organize um, be, uh, because they felt that the police, there was a kind of a police inaction, uh, nobody had been arrested, nothing was happening. There was a, a meeting that took place at the Dominion Centre, which was a centre um, run and established by the Indian Workers Association in Southall. Um, and the IWA asked, you know, said that the youths who were trying to temper the, 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 the feelings and said, let's wait for an inquiry. Um, but the young people didn't want to wait anymore. They were determined that something had to happen. They marched to the police station and uh, two of them were arrested, um, at which point uh, they had a sit-in outside the police station uh, to demand the release of their, um, their, 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 their friends and comrades. And it was this was the point when they thought, right, we have to organize ourselves. We have to organize our own defense. If, Nobody is going to do this for us. Um, there were other youth movements as well that um, were, um, if you like, the organization was triggered as a result of um, a murder, such as in 1978 with the death of Al Dab Ali. In, um, in Bradford, uh, slightly earlier, it was a bit different. So it wasn't so much a racist murder 
but it was precipitated by the National Front organizing and marching through the streets of Manningham where the Asian community lived. But it wasn't just the fascists coming to Manningham, it was also the response of the left that led to uh, young people feeling that they needed to organize themselves. Because when they knew that the fascists were going to march and they were going to hold a meeting in a school in Manningham, um, the Trades Council organized a march to the center of Bradford to protest. But of course, this in a sense left Manningham in a very fragile um, situation. And the youth halfway through the march realizing this went back to Manningham and determined to stop um, the fascists from organizing their meeting in their community. And uh, when I did interviews with some of the, some of the for, uh, members, from, former members, you know, they described that this was what they described as the first time you could describe a, a sort of a riot, if you like, in, in, in Bradford and police cars were overturned, et cetera, in order to say no. So, um, so in a sense, you can see these two forces, which uh, Parvati referred to earlier as um, these two kind of situations as, as triggering the need uh, for young people um, to mobilize. Uh, while many of the members of the youth movements were of college age, they included individuals that were as young as 15 and others that were in their late twenties with experience of political organization and the workplace. This was particularly the case in Bradford, um, where um, members, founding members had been um, involved in international socialist IS, in um, militant um, and in another left organization, oh, the revolutionary communist um, group. Um, so they didn't have a fixed age restrictions. Um, and they were there to represent not just the concerns of young South Asians, but also their families. So in this sense, they were organizations of youth, but not simply for youth, taking up wider issues that impacted their communities as a whole. They included um, um, descendants from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, as well as members of the South Asian diaspora from Malaysia, Kenya, and elsewhere. From the beginning, the AYMs recognized the importance of challenging both state and street racism and um, understanding the root cause of racism as not simply hatred and prejudice, but an exercise of power. And as has already been emphasized, um, they drew inspiration from uh, the Black Power Movement and from other international groups, and they adopted um, a black political identity. And you can see this in their literature, um, such as the magazine Kala Tara, um, produced by Bradford Asian Youth Movement, Kala Tara mean, meaning Black Star, and um, uh, Kala Mazdoor by Sheffield, which was formed around about 1982, Black Worker, and using things like the insignia of the Black Power um, Fist. Um, they, um, this, this kind of, um, this, this kind of identity in a sense didn't, they never saw as, as, as conflicting in any way with a South Asian, you know, identity. Um, uh, they wanted to, um, uh, build and to, um, respect their own linguistic and cultural origins, but also to create a much more, um, broader based, um, political, um, solidarity with all those um, who had suffered a, uh, as a result of uh, colonialism and uh, slavery. Um, right. And you can see here as well, some of, their, um, some of their slogans that were really significant for them at the time, here to stay, here to fight, um, come what may, we are here to stay. So that, that sense of having the right to be in Britain was a really um, important one. The sense of bu building solidarity, you can see as well through the 
um, the, the benefit of uh, two different campaigns working together, the new M8 and um, the, the Colin Roach um, a defense campaign at that, um, that time as well. I wanted to, in thinking about how they worked and how they organized and what we can learn from them, I thought it was, it's interesting to actually look in detail at the aims and objectives of um, the AYMs. And at this point, I should say that, of course, we have to remember that the AYMs were all different. So every single town um, and city um, had different um, um, had different um, aims and objectives. Some of them were much more sort of formalized. Um, these are from Bradford. Um, and, uh, and you can see actually here uh, the influence of organizations like the Indian Workers Association um, on these aims and objectives. In fact, Bradford, before forming as the Asian Youth Movement, um, were organized as the Indian Progressive Youth Association um, for a year uh, before they accepted that a name like that was not really uh, appropriate for a place like Bradford where there were many people that weren't Indian. They were thinking of it as Indian subcontinent, um, but it was too confusing. People didn't identify with it. And a year later, they reconstituted as the Asian Youth Movement. Um, so you can see, you know, to promote the interests of young people from the countries of the Indian subcontinent, oppose discrimination based on race, color, sex, religion, promote equal rights, social and economic opportunities, um, to educate and show the youth the relationship between discrimination, inequality and the social system existing in Britain. So they were very much concerned about putting racism in that wider context of understanding and critiquing uh, um, capitalism. And again, with uh, point D, to recognize that the only real force in British society capable of fighting racism and the growth of organized racism and fascism is the unity of the workers' movement, black and white. So in their aims and objectives, we can see from the start, one is the way in which they were understanding racism, two is the way in which they thought that the, the way in which they, um, if you like, unity, uh, forms of unity sh um, could be built, who they should be built with, and uh, building um, links with the trade unions and political parties were, was important. Although, although it's not listed here, in fact, in practice, they had a rule that you could not join a political party if you were a member of the Asian youth movement, because what they didn't want was to any, have any organization, whether it was militant or RCG or whatever, coming in and trying to take over the Asian youth movement. They wanted it to be an independent organization that would then build alliances and have this kind of like broad-based um, structure. Um, so while they wanted to work with the trade unions, we can also see that they were critical of them so that they were recognizing that those same organizations weren't free of, of racism themselves. And so that it was important to struggle within them as well um, to, to, to overcome the oppressions within them. And we can also see um, the wider um, the, 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 the wider um, uh, issues um, such as um, supporting national liberation movements um, and such like educating people about the struggles in the subcontinent. So it was very much framed, not just about looking at racism in Britain, but understanding it within an international context and thinking about the ways forward to um, to, to struggle against that, right? So thinking in a sense about the goals of, of, of where they were going. I just thought I'd show you some of the um, leaflets um, where, where they, so they were here, we can see they were taking on kind of um, solidarity with workers' struggles or helping to organize um, strikes. Uh, so this one, the solidarity with the miners was a poster produced by um, the Asian Youth Movement in Sheffield during the miners' strike, uh, the Kewal uh, Brothers' strike um, that was um, in Birmingham, and uh, it was both the Asian Youth Movement, the Indian Workers' Association, 
and uh, Birmingham Black Sisters that were involved in organizing um, the workforce there who were predominantly Asian women against an ex exploitative um, factory owner who himself was Asian. So they, they, they were you know, taking on workers' struggles um, no matter who, if you like, was the, was the owner of, 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 of capital. And then on the right was um, the Air Valley Yarn Strike, which was um, in, in Bradford, uh, where people, where the, the workforce was being paid an absolute uh, pittance and they describe it in their leaflets as, as slave labor and refer to the way in which because, you know, migrants are made vulnerable that, you know, um, employers are exploiting that vulnerability to force them to work um, for, for lower wages. And these were some of the uh, leaflets that express the kind of international solidarities Apartheid uh, was a particularly um, uh, a, a strong, um, of course, something that the that the that the youth um, um, supported, and you can see in that leaflet there, Bradford Asian Youth Movement and Sheffield Asian Youth Movement supported that meeting um, by providing um, speakers. Uh, they mobilised to protest, um, and in relation in terms of Palestine. Um, the um, particularly that in 1982 after the massacre of, of Sabra and Shabila and it was Manchester Asian Youth Movement in fact that um, organized a demonstration um, I'm not sure who else with uh, but to to raise um, awareness about that massacre and this and then the the calendar again shows the way in which they were always trying to make links between what they were doing, their own histories as well, and the kind of the philosophies and the, the ideas of this kind of broad-based identity. Um, so here drawing on um, the figure of um, Uddham Singh who described himself, who, who, um, who shot General um, Dwyer who had been responsible for the uh, massacre in Jillian Wellabag in, in Amritsar and at his trial, or I think it was when he signed himself into parliament, called himself Ram Muhammad Singh Azad, Ram representing the Hindus, Muhammad Muslims and, and Singh Punjabis, Azad meaning freedom. So in a sense, describing himself as um, uh, uh, Indian, it was all India at that particular point in time. So, um, and not making a distinction of people being together against the struggle against British colonialism. And the figure, figure on the, I mean, the picture on the right hand side is, is a picket from the Bradford 12. And I will come on and talk a little bit about the Bradford 12 in a, in a, in a bit. Um, but the 12 were, in a sense, um, Hindus, Muslims. Um, Sikhs and Christians, in fact. So you had these 12 Asian men that from these very different backgrounds, or in a sense, struggling um, together. Um, it's, I think when looking at the Asian youth movements, uh, thinking about the work that they did on the immigration laws and campaigning against the immigration laws is, is particularly significant. Um, they wanted to raise and focus on and, and expose the racism of the immigration laws. And um, they, and they also, and one of the things that they did and one of the first campaigns that they ran was the Anwaridita defense campaign. And this image is in fact from the Anwaridita defense campaign. Um, and uh, what, they, what they tried to do apart from raising awareness of the racism of the laws, they wanted to, if you like, put a human face to what was happening, the consequences of what was going on um, as a result of the kind of um, uh, uh, draconian measures um, at the time and the ways in which families were being uh, divided and judged uh, on, on, on application. So Anruditha was a woman who'd actually been born in Birmingham and her family, her parents had divorced when she was nine and she'd been sent to Pakistan. And uh, she got married there actually at quite a young age and had three children. So her, her schooling had been disruptive because of all this, these moves and uh, she didn't really have any clue about her rights um, 
in terms of access to benefits or anything like that. And in around 1970, late 70s anyway, she decided to come to the UK with her husband and to find a house to set up home and then bring the kids. And then upon applying, uh, she was told that they didn't believe that the children were hers. And she went through a series of processes, lost them all, had no, eventually no legal avenue and uh, to, to bring her children to this country. And the Asian youth movements with some other groups like the LCG, um, the Law Center and others um, took up her case and despite her losing her appeal, continued to organize in support of UNWR. And you can see the kind of grassroots nature. I love this photograph because it really gives a sense of the grassroots nature of their campaign. They involved, they really wanted to involve um, everyone. Um, and one of the other powerful things in terms of how they organized was that they would have these campaigns, sometimes single issue campaigns through which they would, they would be raising wider issues around state racism. Um, but they would keep the, they would put the people whose campaign it was about at the center of the campaign. So they um, nurtured and um, encouraged Anwar to, to speak about herself. She became a prolific speaker. Um, here she was, she's speaking on, on, on Blackpool Beach. I mean, she went up and down the country um, to mobilize and raise support. And as a result of this kind of work, and there was a lot of hard work in all of this, um, Granada TV became interested in her case and they made a program about her and her new solicitor went um, with the program maker to Pakistan, they got affidavits, collected material, they did blood tests to prove that the children were hers. And um, the day after the program was screened, the British government, the Home Office, um, overturned um, the, their previous decision and her children were allowed to come to Britain. It was a terrible struggle and I have to say the human toll, I'm still in touch with Anwar now, has been tremendous on her and her family and her children. You can see this was the moment when her children arrived um, back in Britain. And I think here you can see the way in which the AYMs were always looking for ways in which they could raise, raise awareness of different cases and push things forward, of course, with the support of the people that they were working with. So here, when Anwar knew that the press were going to be on her, she brought um, Jiswin the core and uh, Nasira Begum, who were still struggling through um, immigration appeals with her, to be photographed with her, with their posters behind, to raise their cases at the moment when she knew the cameras would be on her. So it's always these kind of tactics and processes of putting on the pressure. Um, you know, they had, and I have to say, just an incredible amount of energy and a lot of creativity. So they were always looking for new ways and new avenues and approaches. So for example, the Baba Bakhtora campaign, which incidentally took years, it was a kind of, um, you know, it started and had kind of gained momentum, fell back a bit and then, you know, moved forward. In the early days of the campaign, um, in the early 80s, um, he, he was a singer who'd been, um, uh, anyway, he, he, his, refu his immigration was refused despite the fact that all his, his, his family were here. And they were trying to find a way to profile his case and they found that there was a loophole in the law that if you were a member of the Commonwealth, even if you didn't have the right to live in the country, you could actually stand in the election, for, you know, to stand as an MP. So they stood him in Hansworth. Um, this, of course, created problems with the Labour Party, who saw this as, as, as a threat to them. Although, of course, it wasn't going to be a threat to them. It was just a, a gesture. Um, and this is where that you know so this is where in a sense their conflict with um, parties like the Labour Party kind of really emerged, 
And really, in the end, they also exposed the fact that it was both Labour and the Tory party that were involved in the production of this kind of legislation. And they had this sl slogan, Labour, Tory, both the same, both play the racist game. Um, and the same thing happened with Mohammed Idris when they stood Mohammed Idris, the campaign stood Mohammed Idris in the, in the, um, uh, in the election as a councillor, the Labour Party withdrew support from the campaign. But they, you know, they had incredible drive and just um, continued. So apart from this, and we can see from the, the aims and objectives, very clear idea of what their agendas were and how they were setting about doing it. We can see as well, even when they had these kind of more like um, visionary ideas about what they wanted to do. So this was the Black Freedom March um, that uh, they wanted to organize it. The Black Freedom March didn't actually happen, but Bradford led in trying to mobilize this march that they set up and it was going to go all the way across the country. And they, 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 they met groups in, 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 in um, a variety you know, of different uh, working men's clubs, all kinds of things planned out this whole route. Um, for a variety of reasons, it didn't happen. Um, I think there was a bit of conflict between the um, anti-racist organizations in the North and the South, so I understand it. But here again, we can see, you know, that they identify very clearly the reasons for their why they're marching and they have their, a very clear agenda. We're here to stay, we're here to fight. Um, immigration was up number one on the agenda and you can see here, um, end of racist immigration laws, all immigration laws are racist and then some other issues around stopping detention without trial, no arrest without warrants, release all deportees, stop deportations and racist and sexist laws. Raising issues around unemployment and also um, Southall where there had been a lot of conflict with the police. So they were, they were kind of had these, had a, a utopian vision, but also always tried to pin it down with um, kind of very clear demands. I would say that um, they were, the, all the organizations were predominantly young men, um, but the, the organizations were different in different cities. And this um, reflection by a woman who uh, was went to university in Manchester but was from Southall and Manchester and Bradford worked together quite a lot so she was familiar um, with both Bradford and Manchester AYMs and had experienced um, the way in which the youth movement in Southall had operated it makes very clear the fact that the culture was quite different um, in these different spaces. Now, although Manchester and Bradford may have had structures and committees and chairs and may have been more democratic and they may have tried to encourage women, that's not to say that, that um, the organizations weren't dominated by men and there wasn't kind of machoism. And in fact, um, on reflection um, now, you know, um, many of them, have, well, they are of course much older, they recognize, um, that uh, there were many ways in which they operated, which made it quite difficult for women to be involved. Manchester, out of all the organizations, made the most effort to involve women, and they had um, a women's section um, where they tried to mobilize. It was quite small. I think there was only four or five um, women, but they did have a little sort of small kind of women's group. Um, and they tried to sort of support particularly uh, women like you know whether it was Anwar Ditta and others who were at the center of campaigns women who were often at the center of like deportation campaigns and, and, and things like that um so so yeah I just wanted to make that uh, reflection um in terms of uh the sort of the gender balance I think I might have I've lost a I've lost a I've lost a poster but never mind I wanted to um, come on to um, 1981 and um, while there was these organizations that were the, the energy, the kind of work that they were doing was, was phenomenal. Um, uh, in 1981, there was a shift 
and uh, in Bradford in, in particular. And um, this was, um, and then there was a split and this was part, this was triggered by the issue of whether they should take, the organization should take state funds. So in late 1980, it might've been 1980. Um, yes, it was 1980. The, one of the workers for the Asian youth movement uh, decided to apply for a grant so that they could have a, a, a they had a, a space that they used to squat in but you know they could do things like have a telephone and just you know table tennis table pool table and, and, and stuff like that so they got a grant of about one thousand pounds and um it wasn't very much and you know they used it for the stuff that they'd said they were going to use it for but before they ever had any money uh, mm -hmm. What used to happen was that all the members of the youth movement used to put in 25 pence into a pot and the, um, the worker, the AYM worker, uh, would have his uh, dole money topped up to the average um, salary of a, of a factory worker uh, to work for the AYM. So he was completely answerable to the youth movement and um, you know would would report back every week about what he'd been doing, um, etc. Now, once they got the one thousand pounds, it wasn't really worth collecting the twenty five pence from everyone, so um, they didn't. And um, they had things like you know the telephone and stuff like that. But uh, what happened was that the executive committee would use the telephone for their own personal. Um, reasons you know when you know they had access to that telephone but they weren't able to do that for everybody who was a member of the Asian youth movement or the bill would have been too much so really from these like kind of tiny um these sort of differences um he started to feel that actually taking this funding was impacting on the organization because you're then creating a two-tier system of you know who's getting the perks and who's not getting the perks and you're getting an awful lot of problems um, uh, and also you have to be answerable to your funders and um, so a group of them felt that a people's organization should only ever be answerable to the people so they had a vote anyway they lost the vote uh, by one or something it's very very uh, tight and the youth movement split between the Asian youth movement and those that left formed the United Black Youth League, um, which didn't, which had mainly Asian members, but they did have a few African Caribbean members too. And it was that organization that um, uh, in July of 1981, when fascists were organizing and for those of you that may not know, there was a lot of racist violence in early 1981. There was a family in Walthamstow that were firebombed and died, Khan family. Um, there was um, a, a group of teenagers in, in New Cross, African Caribbean teenagers um, who were at a party and the, and the house burnt down. Um, Southall, a, a pub was burnt down in the altercation between fascists and, and, and um, anti-racists. So there was an awful lot that was what that was happening and people felt threatened. And when there were rumors that fascists were coming to Bradford, the UBYL made petrol bombs, which they never used uh, to defend their community should they need to. Anyway, the fascists didn't come. They never used the petrol bombs, but as a result of sheer incompetence, nobody disposed of them and they were left somewhere underneath a bridge or something. And they were found by the police and in the August, a number of people were arrested. Um, it wasn't just 12, in fact, it was 13. The 13th was a young woman who was also a member of the UB, UBYL, but she was um, fasting and uh, initial archimedes and didn't really fit the bill of um, what the police would want the uh, young men to be to be seen as as a sort of a, a bunch of, of rowdy uh, criminals, so to speak. So they never charged her, but they did charge the re the rest of them. 
And I, there's a lot that we can learn from the Asian youth movements. Uh, I mean, from the Bradford 12 campaign and from why people supported them. Um, it was, and I think you can see this from um, the, the statement that was made on one of the support leaflets, um, that these, yeah, particularly the leading defendants, had worked tirelessly over the last five to six years to defend the community in different ways. So it was felt very much that this was an attack by the police on those, on organizers, um, um, people that, you know, on anti-racist um, organizers. And in fact, special branch were involved right from the beginning in the arrests and in the interrogation of the, of the 12. Uh, it was a difficult campaign, there's, there's no question. There were lots of, lots of issues and problems, but again, it was very grassroots. So um, it was organized in such a way like, so every Wednesday there would be like, you know, IWA from Birmingham would organize the picket on one Wednesday and somebody, another group from someone else would organize it another day. There was a mass picket on a Friday and then there were small pickets on the rest of the days of the week. So it was very, very, very well organized. And the initial slogan was around conspiracy, um, but the 12 decided to um, file a case of self-defense, community self-defense, which had never been um, tried before, but they argued that their community um, had been put in danger and that they, were organi they had organized and made the petrol bombs to defend their community should that be needed and they won. Um, so it was quite a phenomenal campaign in terms of the number of different groups that were organized across the country because the, these young men had been prolific organizers themselves and um, we can see here the um, a range of the groups that in fact supported them. And I always look at this list, this was on the back of um, a kind of a celebration uh, leaflet. Um, it's just phenomenal. The kind of level of, of um, mobilization and uh, networking um, that took place um, during, you know, for this, campaign you know so you had left organizations religious organizations bookshops feminist organizations trade unions labor party branches i mean you name it it's just it's just incredible uh the number of different groups that uh, lent their support our the Bradford 12 was a turning point and of course the state also knew that they needed to um, shift if you like um, and to to provide if you like to cool down some of those resentments and we know that from uh, the 1980s onwards following the Scarman report that a far more funding was available um, for community organizations um, for particular kind of services. Um, the AYMs in Bradford um, continued to organize. Um, this was one of the actions that they did. Um, they organized the Drummond School Action Committee to um, um, mobilize against Honeyford, who'd made incredible sort of like racist um, remarks about uh, both uh, Caribbean and Asian um, cultures and uh, written against the kind of multicultural policies that were emerging. They critiqued multicultural policies and argued for um, um, a, a, an education policy that was focused much more around um, anti-racism rather than multiculturalism, arguing that an anti-racist multi uh, policy would have to be multicultural. A multicultural policy wouldn't necessarily be anti-racist. Um, but their work became much more service delivery orientated. Um, rather than, um, rather than um, you know, uh, being advocacy focused. And a former member um, who's now works in consultancy and business, you know, made this reflection 
he said the organization became quite, quite fixated on opening centers. They opened a, a youth center trying to deliver solutions for local issues. In retrospect, you have to decide what kind of organization you want to be. If you want to be an advocacy organization, it's less appropriate to look at funding. And if you want to be a delivery organization, then you apply. By 1984, quite frankly, it became a community project. So you can see the way in which the organization shifted as it got involved, if you like, within the, the state structures um, and whatever. Now, of course, it's very important that this work is done, but it's a question of the, 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 the focus of your organizations. A former member of Newer Monitoring Project in, in, in London um, felt that the work that they had done, this was a police monitoring project, a bit different to a community centre, um, that they had actually, that the funding had enabled them to do work that would have actually been quite difficult for them because it gave them so much time and people uh, really did give their life and soul to, to, the, to the work that they, that they were doing. So there, there are contradictory opinions about you know, where, how, how you should work in a sense and what may, may be the most effective ways um, to, to, to work. And I wondered how I should finish this. And I thought that one of the things that I'd really like to reflect on is uh, the Black Lives Matter movement now. Uh, when we think about the structures of the AYM, particularly in Bradford, you know, they had like their executive committees and they had their ordinary membership and they expected you to attend meetings. And, you know, they listed in their aims and objectives how they were going to work, who they were going to make alliances with. And um, I, I, I was looking at the, some of the statements from, um, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement very utopian statements and fantastically important statements um, in terms of um, the, the will and the determination, you know, to uh, eradicate racism, work as a collective, advocate for racial equality and justice. Um, it is, however, pr primarily a decentralized um, movement. And I suppose that there are questions about what what this offers and also the difficulties that this creates uh, for organizing against racism. So all the way through you get these um, statements as well, um, determination to eradicate racism, systemic racism has always caused pain, trauma, untold stress right across the world. There's no critique of capitalism though or imperialism. And the focus is on individuals doing their bit, although they want to do it as a collective. But there isn't a map at the moment of how this can happen and how we can work together. And I, in it, and, I and I wonder the energy that has was there in the summer. What are the ways in which all of us can work towards uh, maintaining that? and the importance of perhaps sometimes having some level of structure and um, transparency in terms of who is involved, etc. So this is one organization, Black Lives Matter movement, that has like quite a good website with all kinds of articles, um, it's quite active. There is also a Twitter, which they separate themselves from, that it's not part of them, um, and um, in the, this Twitter organization, and I suppose because of everything I've said about funding, um, this, the Twitter group, um, I was kind of quite, um, um, yeah, surprised that actually the, in the pinned tweet, they talk, the first thing they talk about is the 31,000 that's been donated, um, but we don't know who they are. And um, so it makes me wonder how, you know, of course they say that they're going to give this money to particular organizations, but what is the importance of transparency in terms of building a movement? Um, I suppose I haven't got answers, but these are just things, and what vulnerabilities are there for something that is decentralized? What are the ways forward that we can think and what do the AYMs offer us 
uh, in terms of thinking about clear demands and ways forward to campaign and organize. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Ananvi. Shall I just start? Kimberly, shall I say a few things? I want to start with a sincere apology. I had um, in my introduction, I want to talk a little bit about your work overall. And um, my head was so full of the US election, I just sort of went oh, headlong into the thing. But uh, fantastic. And I particularly wanted to mention uh, Imperial Persuaders, which I really enjoyed when I read it and put straight on my reading list, which is about the conjuncture between colonialism, racism, and the advertising industry in this country. And it's a brilliant read. I really recommend it to you. Um, that was great, and I think it's so important that we remember these histories and talk about them when we're creating our own narratives about where we can find commonalities, but I wondered if you'd say a little bit more, and it relates to where you finished actually, but also um, you made a passing reference when you were talking about um, the movement sort of falling prey to identity politics, and of course at the end you were talking about funding and the whole co-option into state structures. I wondered if you'd like to expand on that because I think it's an incredibly important question at the moment. We, we all feel the, um, if you like, the legacy of what happened in the 80s and 90s with state funding and the complete transformation of these organizations and um, you know you're quoting from somebody from the NMP for example and I think it's true they were, all those organizations are really full of hard-working people but once you accept funding it starts to put limits on what you can do and makes you have to continually compromise, which means your politics are fundamentally changed. So I wondered if you could say something about the role of class within all of this, because this earlier historical example of political blackness was something that very much encompassed class because of the sort of political worldview that people had, especially from the anti-colonial movement, for example. When we see this particular configuration of uh, an idea of blackness, it tends to be far more splintered. And I maybe wondered if you thought maybe class, the, 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 the important role that that plays in these uh, umbrella terms has actually somehow been lost within this sort of signification. So maybe you'd like to expand a little bit on that. Yes, I mean, I, 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 I would agree with you. I, I think it has. I think both class and an anti-imperialist perspective, in a sense, that um, um, is, is, is crucial for, I don't even know what to say apart from, I agree, I, don't, I haven't got any answers or solutions. Um, the, the, the organizations in the, late 70s and early 80s were formed from people that were very much part of working class communities. As the funding came in, their position within their own communities changed. A lot of the youth movements, the leading members, all became professionals in lots of different ways. And I, that's not necessarily a, a, a wrong thing, you know, and actually the skills, many of their skills that they learned were in the youth movements, organizational skills and, 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 and such like. So their class positions, you know, very much changed. Um, I think in the, I'm not really sure how to answer this question because it's a difficult one. Um, I mean, we know that this is what exists, how, how we can work in a different direction at the moment, I don't know. That's fair enough. Yeah, it's too, yeah. It's a difficult question. Right. Does, does anyone else? I suppose to... one of the things that we we also have to recognise is that at the time that they were working, although they were having conflicts with the trade unions and the left, the left were a much more significant force in this country. Yeah. Until 1989, there was a belief that you could have. And there was a strong kind of idea that you could have a, 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 a socialist system. Um, and really, uh, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, there, was, there became much more doubt about the possibilities of that. I mean, many of us still continue to believe that this was, this was a possibility, but uh, we were often, um, if you like, you know, kind of 
derided for holding on to what was seen as a sort of, uh, you know, a, a retro 70s approach is, you know, how, how people would speak about it. And that led, I think, to a great deal of disillusionment. Um, so the shift within black politics, in a sense, I think is also part of the, the, um, the yeah, the, 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 the collapse in a sense of, of strong trade unions and a left movement. Yeah, so the sort of dissolution of class as an organizing force in, in a wider sense. And I think also because of the way it's been used quite recently in this country, for example, about notions of a white working class, which are somehow, you know, seen as these victims, basically because migrant workers have come and taken their jobs and there's, you know, all the division and confusion that creates is also mm. added to that mix, if you like. You know? yes. uh, the class, working class is not seen as a multiracial, you know, sort of... Uh, um, being, if you like, yeah. Sorry, I'm getting a bit lost about, um, is, uh, Kim, are you going to... Yeah, no, that, so that? I was just going to jump in now, actually. So we have okay. had one, um, we have had one question which came through um, the group chat. And just to say to everybody else, if you do want to raise a question, do feel free to put it in the group chat. But equally, we're happy to hear from you uh, through audio as well. So you can raise your hand and that does um, send a marker to me that you'd like to ask a question um, and then we can um, can get you um, unmuted and then um, have you ask your question in audio if you want to. Equally, if you feel happier putting it in the chat, please, please do feel, feel free to do so. So I think we've already had uh, one question that came in um, and said they wanted to ask uh, where the material you used for your research um, are held um, in a, are they held in a particular archive or did you use people's personal? Well, records? actually, before I wrote the book, I never intended to write a book. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I actually, um, because I started a life out as a, as a, as a, in, in museums and, and, um, and after 9-11 and the, the sort of restructuring of identities and we were all seen in relation to our faith kind of communities uh, which I didn't really have a strong kind of sense of belonging to and most of the people that I knew that had been involved in anti-racist pol politics that's not how they frame themselves um, I just thought I want to collect the materials find out what's around and collect the materials um, from you know the Asian youth movements I mean it was really as much that and I got a heritage lottery fund grant to set up a digital archive I thought well I can't set up a real physical archive where am I going to put it um I don't know why I thought like that I mean I was actually uh, employed by a university but I clearly didn't feel supported by the university so um I um decided to set up a digital archive um and I called it tandana.org tandana actually means glow worm in northern Punjabi, um, which is in, um, in yeah, sort of Patwar, um, in Patwari, which is where my husband is from, and he was involved in the language movement, which is <laughs> how we ended up calling it Tindana. And um, so that's that's how, it, and so the, the archive is still there. Sometimes, sometimes it kind of collapses because it's just um, maintained in a sense by by volunteers now. Um, and the actual, I then did, I collected most of the stuff from Bradford and from Sheffield, where um, people had actually kept it. Um, there was much less material available from Birmingham, nothing from Southall. And there was bits from Manchester um, that, 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 were, that were scanned and, and, and kept in the digital archive. I then ended up with these boxes of stuff and then people said they didn't want them back. So um, all the physical kind of material is now in the Amit Iqbal Ullah Center in Manchester. It's, it's part of the Manchester archives. It's also linked to the University of Manchester. So it's a race relations archive and I've put them there. And that archive also has um, material which I didn't scan because I decided that things like minutes of meetings with people's names that people that you know are still 
alive and well today should not really be circulating on the internet. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so th there is more material, in fact, in the in the uh, Amadik Balola Center archive than, than is on Tandana, but there's still an awful lot of material on the Tandana website, posters and leaflets and things like that. Public materials are, are there. It's interesting when I produced it, and I think this is one of the things about sort of solidarities is that I was very careful to only collect, you know, to, to try to maintain what was Asian youth movement, so stuff that Asian youth movement was involved with, or, you know, um, and when I was writing the, the, the book, um, I didn't want to appropriate the, the work of other organizations. But it was interesting when I produced the archive and then had this small exhibition, people that were involved in things like the Viraj Mendes campaign in Manchester and, and other things said, well, what about Viraj Mendes? And I said, oh, well, the AYMs weren't involved in that. So I didn't think I should put that in here. You know, that, that, that's a whole other kind of history, but people felt such sort of identification with it um, that, you know, the boundaries of how they viewed the history was, was quite different. Um, which is interesting, but yeah, it's all there. You can, you should be able to go and find it. Uh, Paro, are you able to see the hands or do you want me to help with that? Um, sorry, I thought Kim was going to be doing uh, that. Do, do you want me to do it or I, I'm not sure? Fine, I mean, I, I can see them. So okay. I can yeah. see that, I mean, definitely there is um, Clara who has a, a hand raised. I have a question later, but I will keep it for later if, um, I don't want to take too much space. And Kim also has a question. So maybe we should give the floor to Clara and then Kim. Clara, if you want to unmute yourself. Um, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, so I just had a question with regards to like also what we talked about in the end in terms of funding and kind of the development of like certain movements into more like established organizations and stuff because I did an internship this summer in something that had started out as an art project and then became like an NGO like a very radical art project to counter like the anti-refugee rhetoric in Denmark and then uh, ended up being like collaborating with the municipalities actually to be able to um, put uh, some of these people that were using this project in or like giving them jobs um, and just, I thought, I just wanted to hear kind of, I felt that there was some kind of tension or like how to reconcile sort of having like a very radical agenda in which you're able to criticize the system. Um, but then at the same time, also being kind of malleable to the wishes of the people who uh, like the project or the uh, movement is about. Um, yeah, I don't know if this makes any sense. Um, yes, I, I think, you know, that there are lots of um, arts projects and, you know, NGO projects that do some, some good work, you know, so it's not to just deride any work that is funded. It's more about having an awareness um, of the limits and the importance, if you like, of having um, independent organizations. So if you're um, it, it, so it's about the organization understanding the parameters of what it's doing. And of course, if you're an arts organization and you're providing work for migrants and you're uplifting them, um, uh, th these are important, these are important services to provide. There's no question about that. Um, the tension is about should, uh, about, um, when you want to do political advocacy, then you are limiting what you can do when you are funded by those that you are critiquing, inevitably. Does that make sense? Yes, I feel like it, it definitely makes sense, but I was just wondering whether you'd seen any examples of like, uh, keeping this type of rad because I feel like also other organizations I also did another internship with another organization that had started out as a, like a leftist kind of project um, in Palestine against like the occupation and stuff and then 
it started working more and more within the UN system of human rights and this kind of stuff. So I just feel like I've encountered this type of like going from like a really radical movement and then to um, kind of as soon as you become more established and kind of having to give away some of that radi ra radicality, I guess you could say. So I was just really interested in like whether you had um, seen any examples where this hadn't happened or had any ideas of like, I know it's very broad, like solve the, you know, whole world kind of question, but, um, or like had any ideas of how maybe this, you could prevent this from happening or, yeah, I don't know. I do, I can't think of how you can uh, prevent it uh, from happening unless you're organizing and, you know, self-funding in a sense. Um, I think every situation is obviously different. And in the case of, uh, of, of Palestine, the, um, uh, in, in, in a sense, because of the, um, because of the occupation, they have no choice but to take um, some funds um, for cultural projects um, and, and other things. Um, but yes, this is, and of course now what's happened is that uh, the cultural organizations in, in, in Palestine are being straitjacketed by the European Union by being asked to um, uh, sign a declaration that they're somehow going to police all the, um, all the, all the, the work, all of their workers for not being members of whatever organizations or not even having been arrested by the <laughs> by the Israeli state. Um, and we know that 40% of, of, of men have um, been um, in prison because of the, you know, because of the occupation. So this is one of the problems is that when you rely on those kind of funds, then you do get um, constantly, if you like, you get that your radicalism in a sense gets constantly eroded. Um, I think that's just uh, in a way, that's isn't that why uh, the states or the UN and the uh, these NGOs, in a sense, are set up is to is to channel um, the kind of work, the kind of cultural work, and other things that happen. Um, yeah. Can I, can I just interject here because there is a question from uh, someone who actually Miriam Ora, who is going to be one of our speakers um, in the next few weeks who is in a cafe, so she can't uh, intervene because there is a lot of noise, but she asked me to read the question. Or, um, so Miriam is asking, and it's really related to, um, to this discussion you're having in some ways. Um, the question is for all, and it's whether we can understand the decline of collective approaches, whereby the radical politics of Asian youth movement has transformative implications, that transcend beyond their community to other racialized oppressed groups in similar ways. Uh, the radical black power groups or Palestinian solidarity groups have uh, vice versa, et cetera. It's also because these themes have moved from the grassroots spheres onto the professional academia sphere, which is much less about making connections and more about scholarship dynamics manifested by publishing and career promotion. Ideally, the two trajectories are not in opposition, but often there is no overlap. So, I mean, it's a, it's a comment and a question, and obviously, I guess, Paro might have lots to say on the topic too, and lots of... I, uh, I do have one observation, is it's the long-term consequences of some of this co-option. If you look back to um, uh, Anandi's example from the 70s and 80s and what was happening at the end there, um, it wasn't just being sort of having to make compromise, but it was we see this, uh, the, this shift between seeing the anti-racist movement as a collective which was had a sort of um, an analysis of capitalism, imperialism, et cetera, et cetera, something that was radical and talked about structures and systemic racism to one that became through anti-racism being turned into a profession, if you like, if you like, you know, so the opportunities opened up in local councils, government, uh, anti-racist funding policies, which then ended up about trying to change individual behavior. So it became about training programs, for example. Yeah? And we can see the consequences of that to the current day. You know, the arguments going on at the moment about um, COVID and what's being um, you know, revealed about the impact on um, 
people of colour in this country and these ridiculous arguments about whether it's structural or it's, you know, it's something entirely different. Them trying desperately to prove sometimes, you know, for some reason that it's connected to genes, you know, this is a, an old argument that won't actually go away or die. So I think we see these, some of these, that's really why I wanted to ask the question about identity and where the so-called identity politics actually fits in to the wider sort of like a building of a radical movement, where, where it comes back, if you like, because I'm also very reluctant to just dismiss this notion of identity politics as somehow not important in the current moment. Of course it is, but it's looking at how that articulates uh, with class and class interests really, that um, uh, I think might be significant to our discussion in some ways. Sorry, that's a bit um, confused, but I wanted to sort of draw what the consequences are of having these co-options and how they become more than state policy. They become sort of normalized everyday understandings of race and how you actually combat that, that I think becomes particularly problematic. You know, and this, we're seeing the discussion played out everywhere at the moment. Yes, and I suppose it's just all the stuff around and um, unconscious bias has become this whole new thing. So it's all again about the individual um, and about individual work. And I think that's one of the things that, that, you know, I was thinking about in terms of this issue about having a sort of a decentralized um, um, organization. I mean, there's a value in decentralization as it can't be co-opted in quite the same way, but then at the same time, when you don't have, um, when there's, there's a less clear agenda, um, then that in a sense, it becomes very diffused and um, uh, less directed in a sense. I think having very clear aims and objectives, having a clear organizational structure enables you to, to mobilize and to, have other, to bring other people in who know what you're organizing about in a sense. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I actually think that leads quite nicely onto the question that I was going to ask um, about, it, it's kind of going back to, um, when you were mentioning about the Black Lives Matter UK website, which had a lot of information on there and very detailed, and then also the Black Lives Matter Twitter um, account, which they also separated themselves from. And I guess um, also looking at, um, in terms of Black Lives Matter UK uh, versus, I guess, Black Lives Matter movement in the US um, or even globally. And more so, I think that, this idea you talked about, about having kind of clear goals and kind of um, a clear kind of um, idea of what they're trying to reach and how, and ways in which some ways social media um, is great for getting ideas and movements out there to, to kind of a wider audience, but there's also a lost in translation that happens. And I think we've seen that, particularly if you look at things like Instagram, whereby there was a lot of reposting of, of kind of, um, a black a blank page or a black screen and then reposting of um hashtags like black lives matter and there was about you know you shouldn't post this with this and then i think there's been a number of kind of pages on instagram i think which have kind of come throughout discussions of areas like black lives matter um and other areas um of uh kind of racial injustice but then also kind of moving on to more towards the kind of u.s politics front and also slightly more into the satire front in terms of, of what they are now calling these Karens in the US. And I think that because of all of these various different um, platforms, because you can set up an account and start posting and send it out to people, I think there's definitely a, a loss in terms of what the movements are trying to achieve, clear goals, and really ways to energize and bring people together in action. And I guess COVID is probably an additional issue on that in that so many people are engaging online at the moment rather than in person. And so kind of in a way there's, there's less chance to go to somewhere and say exactly what can I do and how can I do it? Um, but what would you say to that? I mean, how can, we trans that how can we take some of these lessons through if it's quite a different entity in terms of what we're trying to address, I guess? Gosh, there's a lot in there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one thing that, um, I you know, in terms of the whole thing about the online versus the, 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 the offline and, um, 
the kind of the, the circulation, if you like, of, 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 of hashtags, etc. I mean, one thing that um, th there's no question about the power of social media just to disseminate. Um, and we've also seen the way in which, in a sense, it has pushed forward um, um, you know, political you know, agendas, but there's also, and, the, and I suppose this has been one of the concerns with things like the Coronavirus Act of the importance of people being allowed to occupy spaces and be in spaces. Um, and um, yeah, so the, the, those are, I suppose that these are contradictions in a sense, which have existed. And um, there have been increasingly, um, I think towards the end of the lockdown, people did start to, certainly in Manchester where I am, started to um, organize on the ground, have pickets um, with regards to health, health workers, um, deaths and, um, um, and conditions and, and stuff like that. And also in relation to uh, police tasering of, of, of black citizens um, and such like. And I think in a sense, the two have to go together when you just let, leave it in this kind of ethereal world, it's too easy for it to dissipate. Um, it's a bit like the, the whole sort of decentralized thing, isn't it? It's about having something where you can actually pin something down in a sense, um, ideas out there, um, but pin it down, yeah. Somebody's asking a question about um, There's a question about gender. Yes, about okay, so Southall Black Sisters and Birmingham Black Sisters did not see themselves as um, they saw them they were not youth organizations, although say a, a lot of them were um, quite young. Um, you know, women. So whether they should have been included as being part of the youth movement or not, I, I just, I don't know. They saw themselves separately. Birmingham Black Sisters used to be called the Birmingham Asian Youth Movement, the, um, the young men's, you know, young men's movement. So they, um, um, I think that they, they wanted their their separate space. They weren't just organizing as youth. Um, and of course, there were other organizations as well, like Avaz, um, that, um, oh, and OWAD in London. Uh, so there was, a, I think, a plethora of different uh, women's groups at that time, many of whom did work with the AYMs but also felt that they needed their own identity. Um, and they did sometimes work on campaigns together. Um, so not just like the Cable Brothers, uh, the, the, yeah, the Cable Strike, that also um, there was a case of a woman in Birmingham, I forget her name, but she was um, charged with murdering her husband and it was a case of, um, it was a case of um, abuse and, and she'd lashed out and, and, and he died and they they campaigned but it was led very much by by Birmingham um, black sisters um, yeah so they they didn't I mean the Asian youth movement didn't tackle head-on questions of of domestic violence because they were focusing very much on on racism um, Sorry, that, that question was asked by me, Anandi. Yeah. I really enjoyed the talk, by the way. Thank, thank you very much indeed. But as you were going through that period uh, from sort of 1981 onwards, I found myself reliving that time because I was just undergraduate student in, at Birmingham. Okay. Um, at the time. So I, um, you know, the Baba Bakhtora campaign, Muhammad Idrish and all of those, you know, we found ourselves going along to uh, pickets and protests and, and so on. Uh, and I knew people from the um, uh, Birmingham Black Sisters as well as Southall Black Sisters who were founding members of these organizations. And, and as you say, there, there was a lot of, uh, well, there was quite a bit of working together 
with the Asian youth movement. So the Bradford 12, for instance, uh, you know, we would find ourselves actually kind of, you know, with, with those, and their case was actually underway at the time in 1981. Um, but I, I, I guess my question was a conceptual one, whether you yourself saw these young Asian women and, you know, being the vanguard uh, in setting up these organizations um, and, and whether you saw them as being part of the Asian youth movement, although they were not behind the banner of the Asian youth movement, if you like, as on, on the street in, in that way. I think if I had my time again, then I would have written the book, including them as being part of the youth movements. I didn't because I was thinking, I'll just go with the organizations that call themselves a youth movement. Um, because where do you draw the boundary and the line? And uh, so it, it, was as, it was kind of as simple as that. And I didn't, I had this real sort of sense that I didn't want to appropriate other bits of history. But as you say, there was so much interconnection and actually um, they were mainly young women that were, were organizing. And although they weren't just organizing on issues relating to young women, well, the AYMs weren't just organizing on issues relating to young men, you know, they were organizing on issues that were very relevant to their community at large. So I think um, really probably an integrated history would be a fuller one. Um, and so, yes, so I hope somebody goes and does that at some point, or at least a bit of it to, to give a better sense of that, you know, a better sense of that flavor. Um, because yes, um, it would have taken a, you know a lot more, and I didn't go into um, the South or like um, South or Black Sisters. I didn't go into many of the London organisations because they published their own stuff. So in a sense, I was really trying to cover work and cover areas and histories that you know where people had not really documented what they did. Um, so new, um, and, and also I suppose I just decided I wasn't going to look at organizations that at least started out as being funded. Um, so the monitoring projects were ones that I didn't really kind of go into, although they absorbed some of the young people that were involved in the AYMs. So it's a, it's a complicated thing and I think it really depends on how you read the you know, read the history, but you're absolutely right that it's very much um, interconnected. And perhaps, I mean, I did talk a bit about some of the conflicts um, in the book, but perhaps some of those conflicts would, would, would come out more strongly if there was a kind of an integrated, um, integrated play, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, I mean, as you say, they're very well organized. Uh, and sometimes there were conflicts there in terms of the organisation, and particularly when people were coming from Bradford to Birmingham or London, and it was kind of, well, why are you telling us how to do things? We, we're quite well organised, thank you very much. We don't need you to interfere. Um, and and yeah, the new monitoring project, for instance, you know, some of the people who came actually came from the north uh, of England. And, and they did, were yes. really instrumental in... In, in setting that up and keeping it going, even even to this day, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, but I think Neon's closed it, now, but yes, yeah. No, no, it's very true. And one of the things there were there were a couple of women. I did interview Shanaz Ali, who was involved with the United Black Youth League, and there was a woman that had been involved with the Asian Youth Movement in Bradford, had been a member, um, but she, for personal reasons, decided she didn't want to be you know interviewed um and then and there were there was one woman in in manchester who i managed to interview it was much harder um uh, finding women that had been involved with the ayms to just to, to speak with and also you know at the end of the day even uh, you know like i spoke to someone in manchester uh, who i know very well and um uh, but they didn't have leading roles, you know, and, and of course they were, there are all sorts of reasons for that. Uh, the two or two uh, key members in Manchester, they were doing postgraduate qualifications, they'd come from 
organizing in the subcontinent. They had this whole kind of history. So people were coming from very different backgrounds and experiences. Um, but yeah, I think fundamentally, they're probably, yes, it's probably better to look at it as, a, as an integrated history. Yeah. When I, look, when I look back now, I would say, yeah. I think you've done a great job. So thank you very much, I think, in capturing that history, which is so important. Thank, thank you. you. I wanted to ask a question to Anandi too, um, and this actually is, is um, it's a twofold question. Um, the first part is uh, around precisely about this point that you, your work is historical. It, it is an account of a particular historical time. And, and so the first part of my question <clears throat> um, is around, the, you know, what has, why and what has changed? Um, why there is a backlash against the notion of political blackness today? And I would really, love to hear your views about that. Uh, um, what has happened to that notion and that practice of internationalism um, that made it uh, become a um, contested notion? Um, so that's today. <laughs> that's that's first part of the question. And obviously I would really like to know a lot, a lot more about the contemporary context in terms of where, where does the youth Asian community stand in this moment in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement or, or the political blackness um, identity or solidarity, international solidarity, etc. Uh, I know it's a big question, but it's, uh, I'm really keen to, to hear your view on this. Um, also because um, the first uh, speaker in this um, seminar series was Kehinde <clears throat> Andrews. And we had a little bit of a conversation around, uh, around that too with him. Um, so that, that's one part of the question. Second part of the question is around um, what I perceive to be perhaps um, a shift um, in, 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 um, or a difference. Uh, for example, I've, I've done a little bit of work on the Palestinian youth movement, which is a diasporic movement, which operates across different um, sites, um, particularly active in certain countries in the United States, in the San Francisco Bay Area. and. Um, in, um, in France and it, what, what really uh, distinguishes them or the emergence of what in, in, in this work that I wrote about, I called or we called with my co-authors, uh, the emergence of a sort of um, an intersectional space of appearance is precisely this, the importance of appearing to one another of these youth who partake in very different and diverse and transnational public spheres where they actually go there and participate and they are pres continuously present either at Standing Rock or at, in Ferguson or in the Creek refugee camps. Or... So there is this sense that being visible to one another brings about a novel dimension of solidarity and, 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 and connection and consciousness. Uh, whereas here, what I could um, feel from the talk is that there is this, so there is this international solidarity uh, that is spoken about, but um, in, a, in a much more national um, context. Um, so, you know, you, you've spoken about Bradford, Birmingham, London. So there is this sense of the national context that is very, very much part of what my understanding of, of the Asian youth movement back then. So, yeah, my question is maybe two questions in, instead of a twofold question, <laughs> but I'd love to hear your... Um... Okay, I'm going to start with the last um, thing about um, um, young people in youth movements going to different spaces to make those connections internationally. I think the thing we have to remember is that um, the possibilities of, of traveling and the costs and, and stuff like that were very different in the 1980s, you know, relatively speaking, flights, all of those kind of things were, were, were much more. Um, and uh, so, they, so they weren't able to do that, although they did um, make uh, lots of contact with solidarity movements, whether it was um, a Tam a Tamils in Sri Lanka, um, or it was, um, you know, I mentioned South Africa. Uh, they had um, um, organizers from, uh, uh, you know, the Indian subcontinent speaking. Um, but yes, they were much more focused on their local local areas. Um, uh, they uh, one of the 
one of the interesting things is that when they, that those that left the youth movements and they wanted to work in independent organizations, some of them set up things like the Pakistani Workers Association. So they become, became more kind of focused on working and making connections with the, uh, the politics of the subcontinent and, and, and bringing those links to uh, Pakistani and uh, workers here and, 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 and stuff like that. So I think it was as, as, from that point of view of um, being in different spaces, um, I, I think it was a, a different time, although some of them did. I mean, so, so for example, Anwar Ditta, for example, did go over to some women's conference somewhere or the other. I can't remember where it was. Um, and uh, so it wasn't that they didn't travel at all, but it was a much rarer occurrence, so to speak. Um, and then the, you, you were asking about political blackness, weren't you? Yeah. Um, yes, well, I think, I mean, political blackness in a sense was first critiqued by people like Madhud. And in a sense, their critique of it was more around the, um, this again relates to sort of the state and the way in which funding's organized because he was talking about how this was detrimental to sort of resource allocation, it wasn't about a political identity. Um, but that in a sense already put a wedge in it um, from that point, you know, it's very, reactionary kind of position really. So I put a wedge in this kind of um, uh, collective sort of identity and spirit that existed. Um, and of course, it's very important to, um, to, to recognize different forms of oppression. So whether it's a kind of, um, a, you know, uh, you know, anti-blackness amongst South Asians or whatever. But, you know, when we look at our own communities, we, there are so many different um, oppressions. So within um, one of the things actually I didn't talk about in the book and I haven't talked about much and it's something that definitely needs to be investigated is um, the role of caste. Um, the... Um, the organization, well, nearly all of them were quite dominated by um, certainly South or uh, Jat caste. Um, you know, where were Dalits within all of this? And um, what are the conflicts both for Dalits in the Asian youth movement, as well as in organizations like the IWA? You know, there, so in any, in any organization, in any affiliation, there are always going to be conflicts. Um, that does not mean that we cannot envisage and call for um, a wider identity around which we mobilize on a political level. So from that point of view, I still find it hard to understand why um, political blackness is critiqued you know, so heavily. Um, and, but, you know, it's impossible to use the term. I'd like to continue to call myself black. I did for, I did for many years uh, beyond um, when it was uh, actually, you know, what was kind of a, like a common parlance, but it ceases to really have meaning today um, because it's, it's in a sense been, um, so critiqued and we, we have to, in a sense, go very much for the vision of, of, of the moment and to find another terminology. But I'd love someone to give me another phrase that I can use, <laughs> which actually gives that sense of a collective strength. You know, I know some people use this term black brown, but I absolutely can't stand it. Um, you know, blackness was never about talking about the shade of, our skin. It was a political concept, yeah. you know. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I've, I mean, in the talk, I used the term people of color because I couldn't think of what else to say, um, but I don't particularly like that one either. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you, Anandia and Parulia. 
just come in as an anecdote, actually, well, two things, because, I mean, for many years I've called myself black as well, politically black, but um, I remember a lecture not so long ago, because, as you know, uh, Ruba, I did a course on post-war Britain and race, and I was talking about this history, and one of the students actually asked me if I still considered myself black, and um, with great sadness I had to say, no, I can't say that I'm black in that way anymore. But the anecdote I was going to tell you about was when I first came to Sellers as a student, which was in the late 80s. And these conversations were raging at that time about who was black, and there's quite a lot of uh, anti-Asian feeling in, in some circles. And we had an Africa society at Sellers, which was very active, but um, it ended up being about these endless conversations about who was black and who had who was entitled to go to the meetings. And what ensued was that ultimately Asians were only allowed to go every other week. And we were particularly put out because we had to go along with white people, you know, so we were upset about that. And there was an Egyptian girl who was in the um, organization who was deemed not to be black in the end. And she was banned also from going on the weeks when only black members went. And this is what it became reduced to. Rather than talking about the politics, we spent a lot of time talking about who we were, who we are and what black men, and it is very damaging, you know, um, when we get to these very restrictive categories about what blackness encompasses when it's supposed to be an opening up mm. and it ends up being a closing down. And so just thought I'd share that with you. It was um, a very poignant moment and so yeah. I think this is really interesting and important and uh, we, we would need, of course, more time to, to dig more into this very complex issue. Uh, but I'm really glad that we managed to touch upon um, the, the question of political blackness and uh, it's back, you know, the backlashes are against it today. And um, anecdotically, since Paru has mentioned her experience, I remember when coming to this country for the first time, I mean, I'm Palestinian, but I grew up in Italy, where the issues of blackness and being brown, I mean, the foreigners in Italy for a long time were the southern southerners everyone else was just like a weird exotic uh, not quite identifiable person <laughs> for a long time until italy became an immigration country um but when i came to this country um to do my phd i remember that the first um of my kind of uh, moment of activism was was thanks to a, um, a social worker who was um, mixed race and in, and she looked at me and said you are black why don't you come with me um, to my women's group, my black women's group. And that was really revealing to me of obviously the political culture in Britain and political blackness. And this was in the nineties. Mm -hmm. uh, and now nobody would, um, would use this um, notion anymore to, to, to fund a group that is diverse um, in terms of sort of encompassing black and brown and all kinds of different shades and <laughs> positions which is interesting. So I wanted to really get to that, but we'll have the whole seminar series or a lot of these seminar series um, to talk about this more. Um, so yeah, I, I think there is also a question that- um, Oh my goodness, I've just realized it's 1846 and right. I'm supposed to be in another meeting. So I'm gonna have okay. to go. I'm so sorry, I just realized. Yeah, no, thank you so much. But thank you so You're much. It's been absolutely fantastic and um, yeah, hopefully we'll be in touch again. Sorry. Of Sorry course. to interrupt, but I better go. All right, thank, yeah. you. thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paru, for chairing, and thank you, Kim, okay. for organizing, and thank you, everyone, for attending. And yeah, hopefully, see, well, Kim, if you want to announce the next seminar. We'll be um, sending around an email um, to everybody registered uh, for this session with uh, the next session uh, for you, uh, which is taking place on the 18th, I think, correct? I guess that wrong. Um, so yeah, so we'll be sending that round to you and it will be on our um, Facebook uh, page and also will be on the Centre for Migration and Diaspora page as well. So we'll, we'll get it circulated to everybody um, we're just setting up uh, that event at the moment for you. Um, I'm going to tweak a little bit with the um, the Zoom invites just to make sure that um, there aren't any problems. I think uh, in accessing uh, the Zoom this time. Um, 
but if we will also take in any additional questions um i mean if you did want to send any additional questions you had from today's session through to um, my email address uh which i will put in the chat box but i know a lot of you also will have had from the um invites because we are this this seminar series is running with obviously some key themes um, and there's kind of a lot of connections between the various different um, sessions that we're running um, and so it could mean that a lot of the some of the questions that you have from today's session would also be applicable to the following sessions that we run um, and we're, we're running the sessions more or less every uh, two weeks or so we've, we've kind of squeezed a few in in the last few weeks um, kind of back to back uh, but they are more or less happening every two weeks. Um, so definitely I'll get them all sent around to everybody. Can I just clarify? You no, know, they are happening every week except for next week because it's reading week. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And uh, Ruba, special thanks to you and Kim. And thank you everyone for joining. It just goes to show how much our conversations and our, our discussions can go on and you lose kind of track of, of time and everything. And this and it is such a big subject to kind of think about. And there's just so many different kind of avenues that you can kind of go off in terms of looking at this. And I, I do think definitely that um, if you can come to as many of the sessions um, as possible, I think you will see these kind of intersections and connections throughout the throughout the events. Um, uh, and I, I'm just even thinking back to that first event that we held um, with Kinder and kind of the kind of some of the key things that came up in that. Um, even in terms of uh, he kind of talked about where he sees himself and his uh, and how he um, sees himself in terms of his origins and in terms of uh, where he sees himself. And, and I think it's kind of something that runs through this session as well. So thank you everyone for joining. I hope. You found the session very interesting. We will send around the recording to everybody. Um, and uh, if you have any questions that you would like me to kind of send out to anybody, please do let me know.